Can I? Uh, we are very happy to welcome Jason Anderson here to give today's talk. Uh, Jason just finished his PhD like three months ago, two months ago? Yeah. <laughs> two months ago from Oregon State. Uh, he worked with Sal Hernandez, who's a faculty at Oregon State, and uh, his area of expertise is in statistical and economic modeling of crash data. Uh, he's currently working here at PSU and he's going to be working on several uh, ODOT and NITC projects uh, with us. You know? Uh, Jason is uh, the recipient. He has won a number of awards for his work. He's, uh, he won the HSIS Highway Safety um, Best Paper Award last, last year. And he was also voted the outstanding student from the Regional U University Transportation Center. And also, according to his advisor, he's like a hardcore, like really deep Sacramento Kings fan and, <laughs> so and, and a Giants fan. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Uh, also, just one uh, one final request. Uh, Jason has a flight to catch after this, so at one o'clock he's going to be rushing outside. You know, so he's just not being rude. He just needs to get to the airport in time. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks for that introduction. I really appreciate it. So. Uh, I just want to thank everybody um, for inviting me here. I know this has been going on for several years, um, so it's an honor to uh, to be here. So <clears throat> this is a little strange to me. My slides for these type of events have always been black and orange. So for them to be green, it's a little strange for me, but it's nice to have something new, I guess. So um, as Avi said, I have to catch a flight, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, the title of today's seminar is Unobserved Heterogeneity and Spatial Correlation. Statistical and econometric analyses of heavy vehicle hard braking and crash frequency by crash type. Now that certainly is a mouthful, so let's break it down a little bit. So what exactly is it we're doing? I don't know which one switched down. So what is it we're doing? There we go. So we're doing a heavy vehicle hard braking and crash frequency analysis by crash type. That's what we're doing. Well, how are we doing it? We're doing it through statistical and econometric methods. And then why are we doing this? Well, there's several reasons, but one primary one is to determine should we account for unobserved heterogeneity or spatial correlation. Now, you may not know what these terms are now, but my hope is that by the end of today's seminar, you'll know them very well and be able to explain them to your friends. So being that I'm new here, and many of you don't know anything about me, and I'll be at Portland State at least for the coming year, I wanted to take a quick minute and tell you a little bit about myself. <clears throat> so I was born in Ukiah, a mid-sized town just north of San Francisco. Then I moved to the Bay Area, home of the Giants and the 49ers. That's funny that you mentioned that. Uh, then I lived in Sacramento for a while, home of the Sacramento Kings. Um, we've been terrible, but I'm hoping that this year we finally make the playoffs. And then I moved to Ukiah before coming to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I started OSU in 2009. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree. I stayed there a little bit longer, got my master's degree. And then I love Corvallis and Oregon State so much that I decided to stay just a couple more years and get a PhD. Uh, now I'm at the next chapter in my life. Um, I was lucky to get a postdoc position here at PSU, and hopefully in the future I can find a, a faculty position at a university. So with that, let's go ahead and get into the cool stuff. So today's seminar is based on my dissertation work. So today's presentation is structured very much like a research presentation. Um, as such, I'll go over the motivation for the work, a quick background um, based on time. Why is my work important? How does it contribute? Uh, and then I'll go over the data, the methods, provide some generalized results without getting too deep, and then give a summary, some recommendations based on the work, and then where can we go moving forward um, based on findings from my work. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the motivation. So being that this is a hard breaking study, we should probably ask ourselves, what is hard breaking? Well, hard breaking is an occurrence described as an abrupt change in speed that makes this black box recorded. Now, depending on the data company or the data collection device, this abrupt change in speed can be different thresholds. And we'll see what that threshold is um, from the data company that we got the data from. Now, this can also serve as a proxy for several factors. The first of which is economic factors. It can impact overall gas mileage, and in terms of the trucking industry, this can cost trucking firms up to three miles per gallon of gas. It also has environmental impacts, as it increases pollutants due to high fuel consumption and particle emissions from brake wear. 
And in the context of the current study, it can be a sign of aggressive driving behavior, not only for the driver of the heavy vehicle, but for all surrounding traffic, essentially all transportation system users. However, to do such an analysis, we need a specific type of data. But getting this type of data for heavy vehicles is difficult to attain. Now, there are public freight data sources, such as Freight Analysis Framework, Commodity Flow Survey. However, these are really aggregated and intended primarily for commodity flow behavior. Now, there are private freight data sources as well, such as Fleet Seek, TransSearch. And although these do provide a more disaggregated picture, they're still intended for commodity flow behavior. So with that in mind, as I said previously, we need a specific type of data to be able to investigate or analyze heavy vehicle hard braking explicitly in a safety context, as is the case with this work. So we were lucky for this project to partner with E-Road. E-Road is a freight telematics data company headquartered out of New Zealand, who through their devices are able to collect a lot of unique data, one of which are hard braking events by heavy vehicles. So they graciously provided us with heavy vehicle hard braking events within the state of Oregon. So using this E-Road data set, heavy vehicle hard braking locations are analyzed explicitly in a safety context, looking at crash frequency and crash type at these locations. So the analysis consists of four specific parts. The first is a density analysis. And this is just to gain a generalized, uh, holistic view of high density hard braking areas within the state of Oregon. The second part, which is one of the more important parts of this work, being that this is where the crash frequency analysis is conducted, is to do a hotspot analysis. Next, a random parameters crash frequency analysis, and I'll explain what random parameters means in the coming slides. Then a spatial lag crash frequency analysis, and also explain what that spatial lag means in the coming slides. And then in the end, to compare these two methods. So which one gives us better results, therefore gives us better inferences, and then so we can make the right recommendations. So with that, um, let's do a little background on heavy vehicle hard braking. And then um, based on time, I can't go all, through all the work, but a quick summary of what work has been done out there and how this work kind of fills the gaps. So it's widely known that stopping distances for heavy vehicles are substantially longer than those of passenger vehicles. And this is especially true if road conditions are wet and slippery. Now, anti-lock brake systems do improve driver control and during such an event, but there's still a high likelihood of jackknifing or being involved in a specific type of crash. Well, to address this, there was a Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard Amendment regarding the air brake systems of heavy vehicles. Now, this consisted of two primary parts. The first was that the majority of new heavy vehicles must achieve a 30% reduction in stopping distance. And the second required that a heavy vehicle when loaded to its gross vehicle weight rating, meaning it's loaded to its maximum weight um, in terms of capacity and driving at a speed of 60 miles per hour, it must be able to stop within 250 feet. And the idea behind this safety amendment was to reduce the number of fatalities and injuries associated with heavy vehicle braking. And implicitly the number of crashes, the crash frequency. So just to illustrate really fast um, the difference in stopping distances between a heavy vehicle and a passenger vehicle at 65 miles per hour, which is a pretty standard highway speed, we can see that on average, the heavy vehicle takes nearly double the distance to come to a complete stop compared to that of a passenger vehicle. Now, if we consider work in this area, um, studies in terms of braking, hard braking, or heavy vehicle, the work's really limited. In terms of hard braking, most of these focus on braking performance, brake behavior modeling, or naturalistic and simulator studies. None of these focus explicitly on heavy vehicles. Now, if we look at literature for heavy vehicles, we see that it focuses on stopping distance as a byproduct of that safety standard amendment. And then there's some st studies on vertical loads and then safety climates of long haul drivers in the workplace. Still, nothing focuses explicitly on specific crash types or crash frequency. And then if you look in the literature for crash frequency analyses, there's an abundance out there. There's, there's just so many studies doing crash frequency. However, a few of them emphasize heavy vehicles, and most of these focus on crash frequency at intersections, roadway segments, or junctions. So my work uniquely fills all of these gaps simultaneously by looking at heavy vehicle hard braking explicitly in a safety context, and then that is done through a crash frequency and by crash type analysis. So with that, I'd like to kind of formally state why this is important and a couple more steps and how it contributes. The first, the data I'm using for this to, to get hard breaking um, hotspots, it's never been used in the United States before. It's been used in New Zealand, but it's never been used here. So it can essentially 
serve as a proof of concept that this data can be used not just by researchers, but practitioners, state agencies, federal agencies moving forward uh, in several different applications, not just safety. Uh, as I just mentioned, it investigates heavy vehicle hard braking explicitly in a safety context of all highway users. This has not been done before. Thirdly, it contributes to methodologies for transportation research, specifically the use of spatial econometrics to account for spatial autocorrelation. And then lastly, it compares two analytic methods to determine which one's preferred for a specific data set um, when doing these data-driven analyses. Essentially, we're asking the question, unobserved heterogeneity or spatial autocorrelation? And as I said, I'll explain these in more detail in the coming slides. So being that this is a data-driven analysis, I want to spend the next few slides really going over the data used and the data massaging techniques that we did. So data-driven analysis typically means several data sets are used, and that was the case for this work. But this work wouldn't have been possible without eRoad providing us the hard-breaking event data. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a threshold for hard braking. E-Road defines this threshold as a reduction in speed of 10 kilometers per hour in one second. Now, that's equivalent to 6.21 miles per hour or 0.28 Gs. Now, this data was collected over a six month period from January 2017, essentially through June 2017, and consisted of nearly 3,000 hard braking events throughout the state of Oregon. So, geocoding the hard braking events, we have this map here. Now, these are the naturally occurring areas of hard braking. I just want you to kind of notice the clustering, uh, the natural clustering of these uh, along this segment of US 101, obviously the, high, the densely populated areas along I-5. And then although it doesn't look like there's much here, there's several coincident points here, meaning several hard braking events happened in the same location. So there's a lot more happening on Southern US 97 than, than what's seen here. I just want to keep this and then keep this map in mind when we look at maps from the density analysis and then also the hotspot analysis. So this is a safety study, meaning that we need some form of safety data. Typically, that means we need crash data. Well, ODOT provided us with a comprehensive crash database <clears throat> uh, that consisted of all police and self-reported crashes from 2011 to 2015. Um, I believe the 2016 data is now available, but at the time of this study, it was not. The most recent was 2015. Uh, now, this data consists of a crash file, a vehicle file, and a participant file. However, due to the nature of this analysis, several of these characteristics, we can't use them. Why is that? Well, for a crash frequency analysis, we're aggregating crashes to a location, or to an intersection, to a roadway segment, in this case, to a heavy vehicle hard braking hotspot. So let's take, for example, we have a heavy vehicle hard braking hotspot, and we have 10 crashes at this location. And what we want to do is we want to take those 10 crashes, 10 observations, 10 rows of data, aggregate it to a single observation, a single row of data, create a new variable frequency, a frequency variable, and in this case, the value of that variable would be 10. So because of this procedure, we're unable to use, we're unable to use characteristics related to the driver, crash, weather, lighting conditions, et cetera. So say if we look at that same example, those 10 crashes at the hotspot and each crash had a different age driver or a different lighting condition or a different weather condition. Well, we simply can't aggregate those values by say an average or a weighted average or a mean or a median um, without introducing severe bias when we do our analysis. So for that reason, we want variables that we can do that with and we call these exposure-based variables. So think of the same heavy vehicle hotspot and it has a posted speed limit of 45 miles per hour or it has a certain type of roadway surface characteristic. Well, if you look at those 10 observations, that posted speed limit or that roadway service characteristic is gonna be the same for each of those observations. So when we go to aggregate the data to a single observation, that value can say, we can keep that value. And so because of that, we want as many of these variables as possible. So with that in mind, several additional data sets consisting of these types of variables were merged with each year of crash data. These consisted of lane width, surface width and surface type, shoulder width, shoulder type, surface conditions, which were rated from very good to very poor, um, barrier type, and then traffic volume. Uh, traffic volume included average annual daily traffic, truck average annual daily traffic, and then it also included um, the percentage of average annual daily traffic by vehicle class, where vehicle classes are defined as the 13 vehicle classifications by the Federal Highway Administration. And essentially, we see that once we get to class five or six, from there forward are essentially different configurations of heavy vehicles. 
So now that we have this, this really large crash data with all of these exposure-based variables, we need to associate them with some way to the heavy vehicle hardbreaking hotspot so we can do that crash frequency analysis. So to do that, we spatially join the crash data to these heartbreaking hotspots. Now, in general, a 250-foot buffer is done, is done for this, but a 250-foot buffer to all crashes and all crash types can result in statistical errors during the analysis. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to mitigate any type of statistical errors that can introduce any sort of bias and affect our results. So based on previous work, um, the highest observed speed limit is used to determine what an adequate buffer area is. At the time of this work, on the most recent um, documentation from the Oregon Department of Transportation, the 85th percentile speed on highways and interstates ranged from 67 to 70 miles per hour. So I elected to use 70 miles per hour as the highest observed speed limit. What this means, and this is associated with a 500 foot buffer area. So what this means is that any crash that occurred at or within 500 feet of one of these hotspots was then spatially joined to that hotspot. And so now that we've spatially joined all these crashes to these hotspots, we can now determine what crash types are occurring most often at these locations. So if we look at a, this pie chart here, we can clearly see that one crash type occurred far more often than any other, and that was rear end crashes. The second most occurring were turning movement crashes, and then both at 8% were fixed object and sideswipe overtaking crashes. Now since these are the four most occurring crash types and the ones considered for analysis, and we are in Oregon, I wanted to take a quick second and look at recent trends in these crashes within the state. So if we look at rear end crashes, we see that they've been, the total number has steadily been increasing since 2011. And although there was a decrease in fatal crashes from 14 to 15, there was a pretty significant increase from 13 to 14. And if we look at turning movement crashes, total number of crashes have been increasing since 2013 and fatal since 2014. And if we look at fixed object, we see that the total number has been increasing since 2013, while the fatal crashes have been increasing since 2012. And then finally, we look at sideswipe crashes, we see that the total number has been increasing since 2012 and fatal since 2013. So not only are these the most occurring crash types at these locations, they're also crashes that have been increasing in recent years. So really understanding the factors that contribute to these crash frequencies can be very, very beneficial. So now that we have the data and we understand, we understand the data used for the analysis, let's talk about the methods. So how did we actually do our analysis? So the first, if you go back to that green arrow that I showed, the first step was to do a density analysis. Uh, in particular, uh, I did a kernel density analysis, uh, as I said, to just get a holistic view of high density area, hard breaking areas within the state of Oregon. Um, ArcGIS was used for this. And if we look at the results, uh, we see that kind of as anticipated, the high density areas are in the densely populated areas within the state of Oregon. But something to note is those natural clusterings we saw in US 90, Southern US 97 and US 101, they're not considered high density areas. So let's move on to the hotspot analysis. Now this was one of the more important parts of this work, as I said, because this is where crashes are aggregated to. Now, this, because of that, this is a very iterative procedure to determine that the distances being used in each step were accurate and accurately reflected the state of Oregon. As such, this was done several, several, several times. Uh, now, the hotspot analysis utilizes, and I always pronounce this wrong, a Geddes or G statistic um, to investigate each heartbreaking event within the context of its neighboring events. Um, in doing so, it produces this Z statistic that tells us whether statistically Heartbreaking is prone to happen here or it's not prone to happen here. And again, ArcGIS was used to conduct this. So if we look at the results from the hotspot analysis, we certainly see that the statistically significant hotspots here certainly mirror more of the natural clustering that we saw on that first map. We have several significant hotspots along that segment of US 101, Southern US 97, Southern I-5 where the topography down there certainly lends itself to heartbreaking. And then the densely populated areas uh, along the I-5 corridor. So now that we have our hotspots, we've spatially joined our large exposure-based variable uh, data sets. Um, now we can conduct our crash frequency analysis. So the first question we need to ask is, what, what type of variable is a crash frequency? Well, it's a count variable. It's a non-negative integer value. So we need some form of count data model to be able to do this. So the first and most common method or way to start would be to look at Poisson regression. Poisson regression is formulated as such. 
Um, essentially what we care about is that um, Poisson parameter here. Um, we just have X is our vector, that's our exposure base variables that we've created, and then beta is the output. It's essentially telling us the effect of a variable has on the expected number of crashes. Now, there is a key limitation to using a Poisson regression model. Um, it assumes that the expected mean and variance must be equal. Um, and if this assumption isn't met, again, results will be biased, standard errors will be incorrect. So what do we do if this is, and how do we test it? We can test it first by running a Poisson model and then manually calculating these values, calculating a theta value, where if theta is equal to one, the assumptions are met. If it's greater or less than one, then it's over, under, dispersed. Or we can fit a negative binomial regression model, which is the most common method to account for this data dispersion. Now, if you notice, it looks exactly the same as the formulation on the following page, except we've added this gamma distributed disturbance term Essentially, by adding this, what we're doing now is we're allowing the mean and the variance to be different. And in the process of estimating this negative binomial model, we get another output called alpha. And this is another test to see if our data is over or under dispersed. If this alpha parameter is significant, then that means we need to be using this model. If it's not significant, it means we should be using the Poisson or, or a different count data model that doesn't need to account for data dispersion. So and now, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a perfect data set. There's often variation or unobserved heterogeneity in most data sets. This is true for any data set in any field, um, in any academic field. Um, these are most attributed to two factors. The first being variation within existing variables due to unobservables, and then also missing variables. So if we look at the first example, variation within existing variables, what do I mean by that? So, and crash data. We generally have driver age or driver gender, but we have no other information about the driver. Think about all of us. We all have different abilities to hear, different visual acuity, different perception reaction times. These things are unobserved. We can't see them in the spreadsheet. We can't see them in the data. These unobservables can become embedded in those age variables or those gender variables. And as a result, unobserved heterogeneity is present. Now, it could also be a result of missing variables. And in the case of crash data, it's not so much that they're missing, it's just that these variables aren't collected. They're not on data collection forms. So when a crash happens, the, the participants of the police aren't being asked to record each and every factor that leads to a crash. Um, so these essentially become more unobservables that can result in unobserved heterogeneity. Now, the key part here is that not accounting for this, and it's become the new norm in transportation literature nowadays, uh, not accounting for this can really bias your model estimates and then, as I said before, affect everything downward. So your results, your inferences, and your recommendations. So to account for this, we do something called random parameter estimation. So if we remember our Poisson negative binomial parameters, well, we take out this beta and we add this randomly distributed term, and now our parameters are conditional on this term. Well, what does this term do? This term allows beta to vary. So think of a traditional linear regression model. You put in your code, you run your model, and you get a value, and it's either negative or it's positive. It's negative for all observations or it's positive for all observations. Well, what this randomly distributed term does is it allows us to specify a distribution, and it's generally specified to be normal, that allows beta to vary across observations to account for observation-specific variation. Essentially what it's doing is it's it's allowing beta to be negative for some of the observations and positive for others. So it increases for some and decreases for others or vice versa. And in doing that, we're accounting for these unobserved heterogeneity as a result of these unobservables in the crash data. So now in the title, it says unobserved heterogeneity and spatial correlation. So the next step is to ask, are heavy vehicle hard braking hotspots spatially correlated? And to do this, we need to test for spatial correlation. This is done, and I elected to do this in two steps. So the first step was to use a Moran's eye statistic and just determine, are they spatially correlated with no modeling involved? The second step was to run a model and then run this test statistic on the model residuals to test for spatial autocorrelation. Now, what is spatial autocorrelation? Think of a time series or correlation across unobservables with time. It's the same thing with space. So we have these air terms which capture unobservables, things we can't see. If they're correlated across space, then we have spatial autocorrelation. It's the same thing with time series analysis. We have these unobservables in an air term. 
we see that they, if they're correlated across time, we have something called serial correlation. So if we determine these are spatially correlated, the next step is to determine the number of nearest neighbors. Now, unfortunately, uh, what I found out there is that there's no right or wrong way uh, to determine the number of nearest neighbors, um, but there are recommendations on maybe where to start um, and that it ultimately depends on your data and then your geographic region of study and how well you know that region. Um, so I elected to start with the square root of the number of observations, the square root of n. Uh, that turned out to be too much with very, very increased bias, as we'll see on the next slide. Um, and then, so I elected to start from one and move forward until I felt I was at a uh, reasonable number of nearest neighbors that accurately reflected the area of organ while also mitigating the bias. And then once that's created, we can create a spatial weights matrix, which I'll show in a minute what this is. Uh, and then we can conduct that spatial lag model that I mentioned in the beginning of the, uh, the presentation. So if we take a look at these plots really fast, we have fixed or, uh, rear end crashes. This one here is turning movement crashes, fixed object crashes, and then sideswipe crashes. Now, what these plots are telling me is that every heartbreaking hotspot are neighbors with each other. Well, we know that areas along US 101 aren't, don't have spatial, same spatial characteristics as segments of I-5 in the Willamette Valley. That's just not true. So this is telling me that not only are the number of nearest neighbors too high with increased bias, but it's inaccurate because they don't share spatial attributes. So starting from one and moving forward, I elected to use three nearest neighbors for rear end crashes, four nearest neighbors for turning movement crashes, two nearest neighbors for fixed object crashes, and then five nearest neighbors for sideswipe over, overtaking crashes. So with this, I felt comfortable that I was mitigating bias while also uh, reflecting the uh, geography of the state of Oregon. So using this number of nearest neighbors, we can calculate a spatial weights matrix, as I mentioned before, which allows us to do this spatial lag model. So remember, we have our Poisson model, no disturbance term, negative binomial model. We've added this disturbance term to account for the dispersion in the data. Well, a spatial model, we add this extra beta, this extra x, but we're multiplying it by this w, this spatial weights matrix. So the spatial weight, we're essentially lagging the variable by a spatial weight. Uh, so it's being multiplied by the weight between two events. And doing this, we're accounting for the spatial autocorrelation or the unobservables across space. Now, in addition to accounting for the spatial autocorrelation with this method, we're also getting direct and indirect effects. So the non-lagged variables, which are these first ones here, give us direct effects on crash frequency, while these lagged variables here give us indirect effects, meaning effects on neighboring uh, heartbreaking hotspots in terms of crash frequency. Um, I'm not going into those results today, like I said, the uh, time limit, but we can talk about it later. So now let's go over some results. So I just wanna briefly go over the generalized results from the models. I don't wanna get into them too deeply. Um, the rear end crash data set was found to be over dispersed. Um, so we use a negative binomial model instead of a Poisson model. Um, 16 variables were found to affect crash frequency, and then nine of those were found to be heterogeneous, meaning nine of them had different effects on crash frequency, meaning positive for some observations and then negative for others. Turning movement crashes was also over dispersed, so the same negative binomial model was used. 13 variables found to affect crash frequency, six of which had random parameters. The fixed object data set, um, surprisingly, was actually found to meet the assumptions of the Poisson model. Uh, this is very rare with crash frequency distributions, so I was quite surprised. 11 variables found to be significant, four of which had random parameters. And then finally, the side swipe data set was also found to be over dispersed, um, so that negative binomial model was used, 10 variables significant, and then three uh, random parameters. So I just wanna quickly go over a comparison of factors by characteristic and crash type. So quickly, the green down arrow means it decreases crash frequency. The red up arrow means it increases. The two arrows with heterogeneous, this means that that variable had differing effects, meaning it increased frequency for some and decreased frequency for other hotspots. And then obviously this means the, that it was insignificant. So one thing I want to just point out on this uh, table before moving forward is that the only variable that was significant in more than two of the crash types was urban roadway classifications. 
Uh, if we look at a uh, summary of traffic control characteristics by crash type, uh, we can see that fixed object crashes were not impacted at all by these type of characteristics. Um, and left turn refuge, I just want to note that although it was only statistically significant at uh, greater than the 90 percentile for one crash, it was very close to that 90 percent threshold for all of the crashes or two crashes. And then if we look at the summary of roadway service characteristics, uh, we see these didn't affect rear end crashes or side swipe crashes whatsoever. Um, and then very good pavement conditions, somewhat like that left turn refuge, was just below the 90% uh, threshold for all of the crash types. So only turning movement crashes was it included. And then the last set of characteristics are traffic characteristics. And I just want to point one thing out here is that it's only the second variable to be significant and more of two of the crash types, and that was class 12 vehicles. Class 12, class 12 vehicles are six axle multi-trailer trucks. Uh, and this had a different effect on each crash type considered. It increased rear end crashes, it decreased side swipe overtaking crashes, and then it had uh, heterogeneous effects on turning movement crashes, meaning they increased for some hotspots but decreased for others. So now I we'll quickly want to go over the results from the spatial autocorrelation test. Uh, so these are Moran scatter plots. How we interpret these scatter plots is the clustering. So in this plot for rear end crashes, we have clustering in the low, low quadrant. This tells us that there's positive spatial correlation. And then if we look at our statistic and our p-value, this means it's highly significant. So this tells us that we have highly significant positive spatial correlation in the rear end crash data set for hard breaking hotspots. If we look at uh, turning movement crashes, we see that that same clustering in that low, low quadrant. And then our p-value and our statistic are highly significant, which tells us that this positive spatial correlation is highly significant. If we look at fixed object crashes, we again see clustering in the low, low quadrant uh, with a very low p-value, suggesting that we have high positive spatial correlation. And then although the least profound cluster, we still have some clustering in the side swipe overtaking crash data set uh, between hard-breaking hotspots. And then based on the p-value and the statistic, uh, we see that it is highly significant. So instead of going, I, instead of doing the, um, presenting some results from the um, estimates from the spatial model, I want to spend the next few slides comparing the two methods uh, in terms of overall model fit and their ability to predict crash frequency. So if we first look at rear end crash, on this side we have the random parameters model. So this is accounting for those unobservables, that unobserved heterogeneity. And then this is our spatial model. So this is accounting for that spatial autocorrelation, the unobservables across space. And we can see here that in terms of overall model fit, the spatial model did a little bit better. But in terms of prediction, we can see that the random parameters model did much, much, much better. If we look at the next data set, which is turning movement crashes, this was the only data set in which that the random parameters model had a slightly better overall model fit. But once again, we see that the Prediction power for accounting for the unobservables is much, much higher than accounting for spatial correlation. If we look at fixed object crashes, although this was closer in terms of prediction power, um, the random parameters model still had a higher prediction, and then the spatial model just a slightly better overall fit. And then our final model uh, is sideswipe crashes. Again, the spatial model had a slightly better overall fit. And in terms of prediction, although not as high as the first two crashes, um, the random parameters or the model accounting for the unobservables uh, has a higher prediction power than that of the spatial model. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and provide a quick summary and then some recommendations. Um, and then we'll, we'll finish up today's presentation. So we analyzed crash frequencies at hard breaking hotspots. Um, this was done utilizing a previously unused freight data source. Uh, being that it was a data-driven analysis, several data sets were used. Uh, it turned out that three of the crash types uh, had negative binomial distributions, while one of them actually met the, limit, or the limitations of the Poisson model. 50 total variables across all crash types were uh, found to be significant, while nearly half of them had estimated random parameters, meaning that there was a lot of heterogeneity and a lot of unobservables in this data set. Two factors were significant in at least three of the models, urban roadway classifications and class 12 vehicles. And then there were some factors that were significant in at least two of the models, such as roadway width, high posted speed limits, traffic volume, rural classifications, solid medians, number of lanes, and then hotspots that were located on a grade. Now, we did determine that heavy vehicle hard breaking hotspots are spatially correlated. 
And also that there is spatial autocorrelation. There's correlation uh, in the air terms across space in the unobservables. So to account for that, we fit a spatial lag of X model. This accounts for that spatial autocorrelation by lagging variables by a spatial weight in between them. We're essentially taking our explanatory variables, we're multiplying it by this weight, lagging it, and then we're accounting for these unobservables. Um, factors were found to have direct and spillover or indirect effects, as I said recently. Um, some had a significant direct effect and insignificant indirect effect, others the opposite, and then some had insignificant direct and indirect effects, some had significant in both, and then some had significant in both but had different effects, so negative direct effect and negative um, indirect effect, or positive indirect effect. And then lastly, as we saw, the spatial model provided a slightly better overall model fit for most, for three of the four models, but accounting for the unobservables, the unobserved heterogeneity gave us a far higher predictability power in terms of being able to correctly predict crash frequency. So what, um, what can we do um, in terms of hard braking moving forward? Uh, well, first would be to monitor and mitigate hard braking events of heavy vehicles. Uh, Hoping this happens with that mandate for the electronic logging devices in heavy vehicles, which the first deadline to comply was almost a year ago now. Uh, trucking firms can also put more emphasis on hard braking mitigation. Um, there's a trucking firm in Texas that actually offers incentives or bonus systems. They do a monthly fuel incentives, a new car giveaway, and then the driver for the company at the end of the year that has the best end of year miles per gallon gets a $25,000 prize. That would certainly uh, make me monitor my heartbreaking um, if I could win $25,000 at the end of the year. And then monitoring and mitigating heartbreaking is something we can all do. Uh, if, we're, if we understand or we can monitor what we're doing as our driver behavior, then maybe we can change or adapt. Um, one such way in particular to mo uh, monitor heartbreaking uh, would be a smartphone application such as Gas Buddy. Um, I use it to find gas, and then I found out that it does this, which is pretty cool. Uh, not all my trips are like this, by the way, but this is just a really good example. So it tells you, it's based on fuel efficiency, <clears throat> but it'll tell you if your trip's not bad or not great. And then if you click on it, it'll show the route that you took, and then it'll give you speeding events, uh, hard acceleration events, and then hard braking events. And then it'll actually show on your route where you did this hard braking or you did this hard accelerating. Uh, this would be uh, one of the most efficient ways or the easiest ways for any of you to monitor heartbreaking. So another question would be what can ODOT take from this? What can practitioners use? Uh, my first uh, recommendation would be to investigate heartbreaking hotspot locations. What makes these locations so prone for heavy vehicle heartbreaking? Is there, are there visibility issues? Are there lighting issues, signage issues, poor pavement conditions, etc.? Uh, we found that traffic signals on left turn refuge increase expected number of crashes. Well, are these located in bad areas? Are the signage for these uh, places poor? Are they in speed drop zones? Are they at crests of vertical curves? Uh, we can, ODOT can investigate the location of these traffic control devices and see why they are um, contributing to hard braking. Very good pavement conditions decrease the expected number of crashes. So this can prompt more projects like this summer's project where everything's being repaved and resurfaced in the city of Portland. Um, there, there's still several, several other routes and segments that could certainly use that. And then lastly, and what I think maybe is most importantly, um, knowing that ODOT uses um, R Studio or R, is that they can adopt this methodological approach to better predict crash frequency. So as researchers, we can create an R toolbox, basically have the code ready for them. All they have to do is input the data, reconfigure the variables that they want to run in their model, and then press run, and they get this output. And this output can better predict crash frequency. So lastly, where can we go moving forward? Uh, I would say explore this ERO data set some more. Uh, can we use it for freight logistics, supply chain analysis, freight planning, et cetera? Next, and uh, kind of an obvious one, would be to look at hard braking and other safety metrics. First thing that come to mind for me are crash rate and injury severity, but there are others. Uh, thirdly, would be to explore other spatial econometric methods. So there's certainly benefits to the method that I chose to use here, but there's several others out there, several others that can be used. Um, maybe they would have better prediction power than the model I elected to use for this project. It's very possible. And then lastly, something that I'm hoping to do in the near future, this is on the top of my black book, is to um, develop an algorithm that can simultaneously account for unobserved heterogeneity, spatial autocorrelation, 
And I've been ambitious lately, maybe accounting for like temporal stability or serial correlation as well. Um, we'll see, as my coding gets better, maybe I can consider that a little bit more. So that concludes today's seminar. That was a lot of information. I hope I was within time and didn't go too fast. Um, so I'll take some questions and then here's my email because I have to get out of here. If there's, you want to talk about anything or send me any questions, feel free to. Uh, thank you. Let him go. Sure, that's a, that's a really good question. So uh, the standard way of doing these is you fit a model where you're not estimating random parameters. So you're essentially um, identifying that the mean is significant. And then so after you've developed this model that doesn't estimate random parameters, you then start testing the parameters on the variables that you've already established are significant. And then you determine if their mean and standard deviation is significant. If their standard deviation is significant, that means that their parameter is random and has various effects. So you've essentially already established that it's significant, and then you're just testing its beta parameter to see if it varies across observations. That's a good question. Yes? Um, I know you differentiated the new vehicle by class, by the way the federal system does it, but um, do you consider differentiating them by, by industry, such as commercial or industrial, like kind of oil, states, or uh, construction? Heavy, uh, yeah. And that That's a great question too, and I, uh, I would assume that it certainly would play a factor in what we find to be significant. Unfortunately, most traffic volume data sets that we have, not just Oregon, but across the country, um, the closest we can get to disaggregating it by, by vehicle type is the vehicle class. Um, that would involve some data collection techniques or, or having a, a data hookup such as ERO that would maybe be willing to share what type of vehicle it is. Let them rip, guys. Yes, you in the back. Uh, great presentation, by the way. I was just wondering when you actually go through such data sets, you always end up getting an intuition of the you know, start off. Which variables are important, which variables, which factors are important. Was there like any particular variable which you wish you had, you know, like as an you think which is an important variable, like if there was a marker which would give you three more variables, right? Was there any other factor which you think this kind of data set missed or did you think? Yeah, so uh that's a that's a really good question too. So depending on the state, the 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 number of variables you have uh, is different. So Texas, for example, has numerous amounts of variables. Oregon's crash data set actually has a lot of variables. But to answer the question, the variables I really would like to use in crash frequency analysis are the ones that we can't include. So the driver variables, or the weather variables, or the lighting variables, unfortunately, we just can't use those. In terms of exposure-based variables, uh, I felt I did a pretty good job at getting as much as I could from the state of Oregon that, pretty, that encompassed almost all exposure um, that the driver would have. So I think I included everything. To answer the question, I want to be able to include the variables we can't include. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, could you summarize and just provide the right in terms of what variables have the keywords? You could, like, you know, quickly say these are the three or four key variables that can't be included. So yeah, uh, I could. Um, so I, the quick answer is they're all important because they're all they all were found to be statistically significant. Um, I didn't I didn't uh, do anything to rank variable importance based on a metric such as t statistic or something. Um, what I would say, uh, just based off the analysis I did do, the most important variables would be the ones that were found to be significant in most of the models. So urban roadway classifications and then class 12 trucks, but without Without uh, assessing variable importance in some way, it's hard to answer that question. Okay. And did you discuss the, the finding with someone and follow up or other institutions? Yeah. What, what reaction did you get? So, uh, I've actually, and I discussed it with the Utah Department of Transportation too. Uh, Utah specifically just wanted to know more about e road data set. They were like less concerned with the analysis and like, where can we get this e road data? Um, 
ODOT, ODOT liked it a lot. Um, the EROAD representatives liked it a lot too. Um, that's actually the, the last slide where I asked what can ODOT take from this. Uh, those recommendations were based on my conversations with them. Uh, and that's where that, uh, the primary one I felt was they want to be able to use the methods. And how can they use the methods? So well, we have to develop a toolbox for them to be able to use it. Yeah. So, um, I guess I'm curious, do you think it's worthwhile looking into like how truck companies make sure like their workers implement like these safety standards? I'm sure like the drivers are kind of pressured to you know make deliveries on time like with free. Sure. Did you like look into that side of it, seeing like what these private companies are like maybe doing I don't know, just so uh, when I was still at Oregon State, we, we actually conducted a survey and we did get some information on what companies do to monitor fatigue or to monitor hours of driving. Okay. Um, that wasn't used for this study. Uh, and they do feel pressured, you're right, but with these electronic logging devices now, um, drivers, they can't go over their hours of service limits, which is why it's even parked on the side of highways oh, okay. and ramps and off ramps, which is an entirely different issue. Um, but no, that's a good question, and that's in a different data set, and wasn't included in here. Uh, I assume you could include it in some way. I'd be interested to see what the results are like. It's a good place to go moving forward. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I suspect that freight trucks will be one of the first to be automated. Yeah. Vehicles. Um, so, do you think that the threshold for their algorithms will be lower than the current black box trip one? Oh, for hard Yes. Yeah, so um, E-Road already has a lower threshold. So the 0.28, if you look out there, um, kind of the average is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.49. So E-Road already has a lower threshold. Um, so it's possible that the threshold would maybe be the same around what 0.28 is. Um, but I, I that's hard to know. It's a hard question to answer. Yes. Um, when you're looking at random parameters, that's possible. I'm going to be I like these types of questions. Is, is that essentially allowing the models to have different um, coefficients at different hot spots, or is it more complicated than that? That's a good. That's a good. That's a really good question. So it's not so it, it's not multiple coefficients. So um, it still has one coefficient. So it still has one estimated mean. But it, instead of just having an estimated mean, it has an estimated standard deviation with it as well. And so we use the normal distribution almost always for these because then we can take that mean and that standard deviation. We can go put it in a normal distribution calculator and then make sure it's centered around zero. And then it gives us a percentage above and below zero. And so what that's telling us is just that holistically, so for all, in this case, all heartbreaking hotspots, it's negative for some um, and positive for others. We just don't know which ones it's negative for and then which ones it's positive for. We just know the split. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does, does that help? It does. Okay. I think a lot of it is just beyond my level of education, but uh, <laughs> current level. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of interest from a long head question on the impact of speed on the car crash safety. Can you just three or four students from ask this question for the webinar? Oh, on speed? Yeah, what, what is the impact of speed, speed limits on which you, which you found in your, uh, your model? Sure. Yeah, so um, speed limits, not only in this work, but in a previous study that I've done, as well as, um, as other people's studies. Um, high posted speed limits decrease, and this, most people will find this counterintuitive, but high posted speed limits decrease crash frequency and crash rate, while low speed limits actually increase crash frequency and crash rate. And that's also what I found in this work. Um, most people associate high speed um, with crashes, but it's with severe crashes, not frequency of crashes. And that's been found in almost every crash rate or uh, frequency study that involves posted speed limits. They find that. That's pretty well known across. Yes? In your opinion, why do you think that higher crash frequency is um, uh, 
related to lower speed limit as opposed to higher speed limit? That's a, I don't think I have a direct um, answer for that. I think I can just say look at uh, other states that have higher posted speed limits or other countries that have higher posted speed limits or no posted speed limit at all. The frequency or the rate of crashes is much lower. Uh, so I just think the air, empirical evidence shows that higher speed limits reduce crashes. I don't, I don't have an exact reason for you. I'm wondering if it had something to do with possibly specific road characteristics which would allow for a higher speed limit, sure. something like that. Maybe the road characteristics are correlated. Yeah, the posted speed limit can certainly be a proxy for other things. So high posted speed limits are only going to be on, we assume to be maybe straight segments or segments with not a lot of curves or good pavement conditions. That's certainly, that can certainly be it. Well, um, another question from the school. Okay. Watching all of that. Um, do you know if this hotspot information is provided back to the drivers? Maybe this could be a useful information, maybe either with a DMV or a port or together all the time. Do you know if there's any sort of communication? Uh, as of now, I don't think there's been any form of communication. Uh, I know that uh, a truck at fault uh, study that. I'm still somewhat involved with with Harvard State University. Um, we're going to include this, and we're working directly with ODOT Motor Carrier uh, and ODOT. Um, ODOT Motor Carrier is the center for freight in the state of Oregon. Uh, I will be sharing this information with them. I would assume that they would disseminate that information to uh, to truck drivers across the state. Yes. So, what got you interested into this topic? Because before this, I had no idea this was an issue for like free truck. Sure. And now that you presented it, it makes a lot of sense why we want to look into that. So, sure. just kind of curious. So, I, I like that question. So, the my main interest is the is the technical side of it. I love the modeling and the statistical and econometric part. Um, in terms of like the specific application of hard braking. Uh, we had considered it before, but we weren't sure if we could get the data. Um, it sounded like an interesting topic, and I definitely wanted to explore it with my data, you know, analytic techniques to see, like, what, what can we come up with? Can we come up with anything useful? And then um, E-Road said that they could provide us some, uh, and once we got the data, found out what we could do with it, and it just turned out to be really exciting and really cool work, and I just kind of ran with it, and that's what we got. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, have you considered doing this test with all of the e data in another state and then taking the results and kind of comparing and seeing if there's like parallel results? I actually love that question. Um, wanting to know if model results or factories are spatially transferable uh, is always of particular interest. Um, I, it would be a little difficult to get the um, Eero data like this. It was kind of a proof of concept, so we were able to get it, um, you know, gratis, which was really nice. Um, but I would, I would like to compare it to other states to see, you know, are there any differences? Is it similar or not? I just don't know how feasible it is right now.